Today on Know the Truth from Philip de Courcy. Remember the prayer of the Lord Jesus, John 17, 17, where Jesus prays, Father, I pray you'll sanctify them by your truth. And then what? Your word is truth. If God speaks, I would assume he would speak only that which is consistent with his character. And I believe he does. He's truthful and trustworthy. His word is truthful and trustworthy. When we write an email or a letter, it's impossible to keep our personality and character from seeping through each line. Something of our nature is expressed through our words and phrasing. And the same is true of the Bible. Because it's God's book, we see traces of His unchanging attributes in each line. And that's our subject today on Know the Truth. We're revisiting a popular message from earlier this year called More Than Mere Words. Philip DeCourcy is teaching from 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. I like what John Christenstum, the great Bible expositor of the early church, said. It is a great thing, this reading of the Scriptures, for it is not possible ever to expand the mind of the Scriptures. It is a well that has no bottom. Martin Luther said regarding Bible study, we must ever remain scholars. We cannot sign the depth of one single verse in Scripture. We get hold but of the ABC, and that imperfectly. He's right. In fact, coming to the Bible is like coming to the edge of an ocean. Some of you can remember this far back when you were a little toddler, you know, and you waded into the cold waters of the Pacific Ocean, up to about your ankles, and, and that was your first taste of the ocean. But as time went by, you realized it just gets deeper and deeper. And over time, you wade in up to your knees, and then your waist, then your chest, and then it's in over your head. In fact, if you truly want to explore the ocean, you better go and buy yourself a submersible because it's that deep. And the Bible's like that. This is an inexhaustible book. And we don't have many days left to study it. We better get about the business of grasping its comprehensiveness and its completeness. Remember, we're making a comparison between the attributes of God, who God is in His character and the nature of the Bible. And we're trying to connect some dots because if God is the author of the book, which is our conviction, all Scripture is inspired by God, then we're going to see some parallels between who God is and what the Bible is. And I want you to notice the Bible's inerrancy. See, God is true and truthful and trustworthy. Go back to Psalm 31 and verse 5, and you'll see a description of our loving God. Into your hand I commend my spirit, says the psalmist. You have redeemed me, O Lord God of truth. We read in 1 John 1 verse 5 that there is no darkness in our God. He dwells in unapproachable light. There's no dark side to God's nature. We read in Titus 1 verses 1 through 2 that God never lies. We read in Deuteronomy 32, verse 4, that as for God, He is perfect and all His ways are just. There is no flaw within His character and there are no mistakes within His plans. He does things unerringly. He is truth and trustworthy. So believing God to be the author of the Scriptures, we would readily conclude that the Bible then is and should be true and trustworthy if it is from the hand of God. And it is. God is dependable, therefore I expect the Bible to be reliable. I don't think it it shouldn't lead me down some garden path. It shouldn't deceive me. It ought to be completely true in all its facts and facets, and I believe it is. The Bible is without the alloy of error. This is what theologians call the Bible's inerrancy or infallibility. Let me give you a couple of verses that will point you in that direction. These are all studies in and of themselves. But in Psalm 18 and verse 30, we read, As for God, His way is perfect. The word of the Lord is proven. He is a shield to all who trust in Him. 
Let's go to that famous 19th Psalm where the law of the Lord is perfect. What else do we read about the law of the Lord? Psalm 19, verse 9, for the fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever, and the judgments of the Lord are true and righteous all together. In Psalm 119 and verse 160, we read these words. This is a psalm celebrating the Word of God, describing its character and nature. And in the 160th verse, we read, The entirety of your word is true, and every one of your righteous judgments endures forever. One last verse from the Old Testament would be Proverbs 30 and verse 5. Again, describing the nature of God's Word and how it's inerrant in character. Verse 5 of Proverbs 30, every word of God is pure. He is a shield of those who put their trust in Him. Do not add to His words, lest He rebuke you and you be found a liar. Remember the prayer of the Lord Jesus, John 17, 17, where Jesus prays, Father, I pray you'll sanctify them by your truth. And then what? Your word is truth. So the Bible is true, just as God is true. That's why I put it into a special and supernatural category as a book. I want to argue for its divine character. I want to see God as its source. If God speaks, I would assume He would speak only that which is consistent with His character. And I believe He does. He's truthful and trustworthy. His Word is truthful and trustworthy. Erwin Lutzer said it like this, it would be unthinkable to have an untruthful message from a truthful God. He's right. Maybe we need to remember counsel given by a pastor to a skeptic who was kind of relating how he questioned some things in the Bible and he struggled with those things. So the pastor said, look, here's my best advice. It's a bit like eating fish. You sit in a nice restaurant, you get yourself a good bit of fish, but there's some bones in the fish. He says, what you want to do is enjoy the fish and don't choke on the bones. Take the bones out and leave them to the side of the plate. And his point is, you know what? There are alleged discrepancies in the biblical text, but number one, they're so small. Number two, many of them are beginning to be answered. Don't choke on the bones. Enjoy the fish. And my friend, that's the sad plight of many of our friends. They want to go to some obscure text, to some obscure time, to some obscure issue in the Bible. They want to point to that. And yet the veracity and historicity of the story of Jesus and the attesting of what we know to the biblical story, they miss it. You don't see something satanic in that? I do. Satan's been questioning the Word of God from day one. But let's look at its inerrancy. Let me try and reinforce for a few minutes its truthfulness and its trustworthiness. I want to do it in two ways. I want us to look at the trustworthiness of the Bible regarding the past, its historical details, its record of the physical world and people within it. And then I want to do something else. I want us to look at the truthfulness and trustworthiness of the Bible regarding the future. See, one of the distinct things about the Bible is it not only takes us back, it catapults us forward. 27% of the Bible is prophetic. Again, we're back to the incomparability of the Bible. 27% of the Bible is prophetic, and many parts of that 27% have been 100% fulfilled. This is a unique book. This is God's Word. It's true. Let's look back and then look forward. Archaeologists dig, and what they find is that the historical data that they're uncovering matches the biblical text. The Bible is a record of what God has done within history. I think it's important that we as Christians grasp that, understand that. The Bible is not a book of hidden codes and magical characters in fantasy lands. Now, that's called the Book of Mormon, okay? But the Bible, the Bible is a testimony to God's work among the nation of Israel and among the nations. It's historical in its nature. It is set against the backdrop of times and places and kings and kingdoms. The Bible opens itself to criticism because it talks about real people and real times and real actions and invites you to take a look at what God did. And the evidence is clear. 
I love that statement in Acts 26, verse 26, when Paul is before Agrippa, and he's talking about the spread of the church and the gospel, and you know, it's creating some waves within the society, and there's upset, and so Paul is hauled before Agrippa, and he says, hey, you know about this. You've heard about all that's going on. And he says this, it wasn't done in a corner, all right? I love that. I think that's just a a summary statement of, of the biblical record. I mean... God does things demonstrably. He saves the people of Israel from Egypt. What God does is demonstrable. It wasn't done in a corner. It's not done behind closed doors. It's not to be whispered and talked about in private company. No, the Bible's an historic book. It talks about peoples and nations and places and times, and it bears scrutiny. I mentioned it a few moments ago. There was a time when The Old Testament's reference to the Hittites was questioned. There was no evidence of a Hittite civilization. Well, remember, give God time. Let's dig a little deeper. 1911 to 1912, Professor Hugo Winkler of Berlin discovers the Hittite capital and points to a Hittite civilization. And the Bible proves itself to be true. The existence of Solomon's reign and his thousands of horses was one time questioned. But if you've been to Megiddo, which I have, beautiful part of Israel, you'll discover that Megiddo is one of five chariot cities that have been excavated and revealed the ruins of thousands of stalls for horses and chariots talked about in 1 Kings 10, 26 to 29. Let's go to the New Testament We were there just last year walking around the pool of Bethesda, discovered in recent years the five columns, porches talked about in John chapter 5, verse 2. On one particular afternoon, along with the Living Waters crew, we stood at Caesarea Philippi, and we stood at Pilate's stone, an historical inscription to show that he was indeed over Caesarea. Because there was a time when the critics of the Bible questioned the existence of Pilate. He doesn't show up anywhere. Well, he just showed up recently, proving the Bible to be true again. William Ramsey, a noted historian and archaeologist, in fact, he was an eminent authority on matters of geography and history in the ancient world. He's out of the University in Aberdeen, Scotland. He set out to take a look at Luke's gospel and the church's history as we find it in the book of Acts. And he started out as a skeptic. In fact, here's his words regarding Luke's writing in the book of Acts. A highly imaginative and carefully colored account of primitive Christianity. Note the words highly imaginative. But as he studies Luke's gospel, as he studies the book of Acts, he concludes, quote, Luke's history is unsurpassed in trustworthiness. In fact, he converts to Christianity through his research. He discovered that Cyrenius was twice governor of Syria, first when Christ was born, and again at a latter period. The cycle of consensus shows that the appropriate one recorded by Luke was around about 6 to 5 BC, which is commonly accepted as the date of Christ's birth. We could go on multiplying the evidence for the historicity of the Bible By the way, a little footnote to this, the Bible's also accurate in its description of the physical world. It's not a science book. It's a book about God's love for us and Jesus Christ. It's a book of redemption. But I'll tell you this, since it was written, we believe, by the creator of all living things, the maker of heaven and earth, one would expect it, while it's not a science book, one would expect it not to be unscientific, that in its descriptions, we would have a good understanding of the physical world. And the amazing thing is, as medical science and science has moved forward, every discovery in the field of geography and medicine is reinforcing what we see in the Bible. There's not scientific statements made in the Bible, but it's interesting. We have come to understand that the blood system is is the delivery system, in a sense, of life. Remember that verse in Leviticus? What does it say? Life is in the blood. Well, it's not a scientific statement, but the God who made us gives us a little clue. Yeah, I know, because I did it all. Life's in the blood. You go back to Leviticus, we learn about the need for disinfectants and quarantining those who are diseased. 
The Bible talks about how the, the world is suspended on nothing, which was not a commonly held view until recently. Authorities in China and Babylon, Assyria and Egypt asserted that only rain and rivers filled the ocean. But Moses, Job and Solomon all wrote of springs and fountains in the deep. The ocean floor was thought to be smooth, sandy, and lacking any usual geographical features. And yet 2 Samuel 22, verse 16 says what? Talks about the valleys of the sea, the canyons that form the ocean bed. Job 38, verse 16 talks about the recesses of the deep. It's amazing. The earth was thought to be flat for many years, and yet the prophecy of Isaiah says that God sits on the circle of the earth. Well, it's not a science book, but it corresponds to all true science. Take some time and read it. There's some great resources out there that's dealing with that. In fact, let's go back to the oceanography issue. Matthew Fountain Morey, 1806 to 1873, is the father of hydrography and oceanography. He derives some of his scientific ideas through reading the Bible. His peers criticized him, but he defended himself, quote, I have been blamed by men of science both in this country, the U.S., and in England for quoting the Bible in confirmation of the doctrine of physical geography. The Bible, they say, was not written for scientific purposes. Well, that's true, parenthesis, although it's not unscientific. He goes on, and is therefore of no authority in matters of science, I beg your pardon. The Bible is authority for everything it touches. Because you see, it's inerrant. If it's going to speak about geography, it's going to be true. If it's going to speak about oceanography, it's going to be true. If it's going to talk about the importance of your blood system, it's going to be true. If it's going to talk about precipitation and the whole hydrological cycle in the book of Isaiah, it's going to be true. If it's going to describe the form of the world, it's going to be true. It's a circle. My friend, the Bible is true regarding the past, its history, and its description of the physical world. Secondly, the Bible is true regarding the future. It not only takes us back, it catapults us forward. It not only records history, it makes prophecies about people and places. It shows us tomorrow's world. It writes the headlines before they're ever printed on any daily newspaper. That's the nature of the Bible. Let's take one book as an example of that, the whole book of Revelation, the capstone on the canon of Scripture. It's described in Revelation 1 verse 3 as a word of prophecy. It's going to tell us how it's all going to end. It's not talking about A.D. 70. It's not talking about some recycling of historical events constantly throughout history. It takes us to the end, and it details the events that will unfold until Jesus comes again. And the kingdoms of this world will become the kingdom of our God and Savior. And you know what? I'm not surprised the Bible is 27% prophetic in nature, to quote my friend Mark Hitchcock. You know why? Because we have a God who's not bound by time, who doesn't age. He's eternal. He's transcendent. He knows the end from the beginning, Isaiah 46, verses 9 through 10. Our God knows the end from the beginning, says Isaiah, and the thing's not yet done. The Bible takes us behind the curtain. And you know what? We could spend another week in this, but I'm determined to finish the section we're in. We could look at the prophecies concerning individuals, the death of Ahab, and how the dogs would lick his blood. We could talk about Tyre and Sidon. We could look at the magnificent messianic prophecies concerning the Lord Jesus Christ. But let me just touch on one aspect of prophecy. How many of you have visited Israel? I have a number of times, and if God spurs you and you can do it, everybody should visit it once in their lifetime. I was there twice last year. Go home today and look at that little sliver of a land up against the Mediterranean Sea. Look at the vast nations that surround it. Many like Iran committed to its destruction. We're seeing the spring rising now is simply an emergence of militant Islam, which is a danger to Israel. When you go to Israel, you'll be amazed. It's a rose blossoming in the desert. And you walk its ancient sites and you look at its people, the Orthodox Jew bobbing up and down in meditation at the Western Wall. And you're amazed that given the programs and the Holocaust, 
and the nations that are set against it, both in the surrounding nations and in places like Europe, you ask yourself, how did this nation ever come about? How does it survive? Can I tell you why? Because the Bible says it will. The Bible tells us that Israel is unique among the nations. They are truly the one nation under God. God called Abraham, told him he was going to make him a nation that would bless the nations. And God has kept that promise with Abraham and the descendants of Abraham. The Bible tells us that Israel was going to be 400 years in Egypt. That's what happened. The Bible told us there'll be 70 years in Babylon. That too happened, but God said he'd bring them back, and he did. He said he was going to scatter them among the nations if they disobeyed, and he has. They were going to be hounded and persecuted according to Deuteronomy 28, verse 65 to 67, and that has happened. But the Bible says that Israel will endure forever. Genesis 17, 7, Isaiah 66, 22, Jeremiah 31, 35 to 36. God said the sun would have to fall out of the sky before he would forget his promises to Israel. They will retain their identity. I don't know the significance of the nation right now in the land, but it's significant because God is regathering them. They're emerging. They've retained their identity. They're a nation among the nations because of the Belflower Declaration. They were recognized in 1948. It's an amazing story, and the story isn't finished because Romans 9 and 11 tells us that blindness in part has happened unto Israel. And Jerusalem will be trodden down until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. But when those times are finished, God will send his son to deliver his ancient people, fulfill his promises. And according to Zechariah 14, the nations will go up and worship in Jerusalem. And we have a problem calling Jerusalem the capital of Israel. Oh, my friend, that's their story. It's an amazing story. And you can only understand that if you believe the Bible. You can only make sense of it if you believe the Bible. You want to believe the Bible? Then you take a flight to Jerusalem and take a look around you, and you'll see prophecy being filled before your very eye. The Bible is certainly more than mere words, and that's the title of our message today from Philip de Corsi here on Know the Truth. This sermon originally aired earlier this year, and we received such wonderful feedback that we decided to revisit it today with a special encore broadcast. But remember, You don't have to wait for us to re-air your favorite messages. You can access the complete archive of teaching from Philip DeCourcy when you go to ktt.org or download the free KTT app to your smartphone or tablet. The online archive and mobile app are both completely free to access thanks to support from your fellow listeners. We're so grateful for all who have come together and linked arms with us financially to make Know the Truth possible. And as you've been blessed, strengthened, and equipped through this program, Will you extend that gift to another listener by donating today? And to express our gratitude for your partnership, we've selected a fantastic resource we'd like to send you in preparation for a series we'll be starting later this week. We're going to be talking about spiritual warfare, and this book is a perfect way to deepen your study. It's titled Spiritual Warfare in the End Times by Bible scholar Ron Rhodes. Have you ever wondered about Satan, who he is, and how he operates? Well, Ron Rhodes explores these questions through the lens of Scripture and offers practical takeaways for your daily life. We hope you'll request a copy when you donate today so you can have it on hand when we begin our series later this week called Armed and Dangerous. In addition to the book, we'll also send you a brand new study card from Philip called This Means War, featuring scriptural insights from the Armed and Dangerous series. Request both resources when you donate today. Call 888-644-8811 or simply go to ktt.org. I'm your host, Wayne Shepherd, inviting you to join us Tuesday for another Encore message from our popular series, Classic Christianity, More Than Mere Words. That's next time on Know the Truth. Today's program was produced and sponsored by Know the Truth Incorporated. Jesus said, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Mm-hmm.